it's not very often that I'm embarrassed to not do introductions, but we know we don't do this here on Back Chat. So I want to thank you, say a big thank you to our sponsors, to Bluebet, to Whippersnapper, to Margaret River Roasting Co., to Shelter, to Leaderville Cameras. We appreciate your support. But sitting in front of me right now, he's a, one of Australia's great cricketing icons. But Justin, my first question, which we ask the same question to everyone coming on this show, we know you've done a gr- lot of great things on the cricket field, both as a player and as a coach, and you're moving away from cricket perhaps now. I'm not sure what's life after cricket, but I'm here to ask you to start the Back Chat show with Justin Langer. What's your grading, greatest sporting moment not on the cricket field? Oh, man. We know you're good at cricket, Where mate. do you start? We know, Where do you start? We, we know you're good Where at cricket. Where do you start? Am I allowed one? Yeah. Oh, come <laughs> on now. You're allowed one. I know you're a big, big footy man. You played a lot of sport as a kid, as a junior. Oh, Scully. How do you start with one? I got... There's got to be one I, that comes to mind first. Okay, the first one that came to mind was Damien Oliver, Melbourne Cup, after his brother had died, looking up. That was a magical moment. No, no, me. no. Okay, we haven't explained it right. Yeah. So, Dan, why don't okay, you tell my, us, Justin? So, this is my greatest sporting... It's my greatest sporting achievement more so than moment. Yeah. So, things that you've done that, that are... That we want to know what you've done off the cricket so pitch. We know me, you're a good cricket player. We want to know what you've oh, done yeah. away right. from the cricket field. Yeah, so I, I played footy, basketball, I played it all. But, uh-huh. but for me, cri- cricket... And, and I know as soon as you walked in, your eyes locked with that cricket trophy in front of you. Yeah. Um, Chuit Hill Cricket Club. You probably know Chuit Hill Cricket Club. Yeah, Chuit Hill, yeah. Um, under 12s grand final five for 16 no yeah, not right. bothered respect um, well yeah, done we lost yeah. the grand final yeah. um, I I'm glad I never had to face you <laughs> yeah. look at you you're a scary leg looking spinners. bowler eh? yeah. I thought it was leg five spin. for 12 yeah, it was a five for 16 five it? for 16 yeah, yeah. under 12s leg spin. I used to eat leg spin <laughs> not with mine I'd be throwing yeah. wrongins in and stuff you wouldn't mate I can see it. I can see wrongins from a mile away <laughs> seriously you don't scare me at one second Morally used to scare me you don't scare me leggies leggies I used to eat them JL some people have compared Dan Cons with Murali. Yeah. I mean, you've just done it clearly. Um, uh, sometimes I come out with left hand, you never know. Yeah, right. Whatever you want, mate. What have I you bat, got? I, I bat right-handed sometimes yeah, too, so true. bring it on, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want. Oh, I haven't played for 10 years. I haven't played for 10 years. I still reckon I'd eat you, to <laughs> eat you up. There you go. That's all right. All right. You know. I, I won a national under-9s 80-metre hurdle championship as a mm. junior. Mm. Um I was quick, just put a couple of obstacles in my way, still did it, was mm. tall back in the day. It was a big moment for me, under nine Does it have champion. to be a sporting achievement? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, look, someone's ha- someone's talking about being the lead in a play in high school. That's close to sport. Mm. Uh, my my, f- my s- favourite sporting moment, I played for the Warwick Black Footy Club. Yes. We won six flags in a row. Yes. That's <laughs> huge. And I loved every, and they're still some of my best mates. And I learned about community. I learned about winning, uh, and it was just an, a magical. I, I learned about teams. I still eat before I sort of was playing Test cricket. The night before I batted, I still ate special fried rice because my mum and dad used to make buy me special fried rice <laughs> the night before a granny. That's good. And we won six in a row. So I mean, you know, routines and superstitions and all that sort of shit. So, yeah, um, yeah special fried rice, Warwick Black. That's my special moments. Yeah, we we know you're a batter though, and you said that you'd eat Dan Const alive five for sixteen leg spinners, but you only bowled one over at Test level. Mm. Do you Classic. Rem- oh do yeah, I remember it. Do you yeah, remember that? Absolutely. It was a we'd won sixteen straight Test matches. We were in Calcutta. There was 100,000 people there every day at Eden Gardens. It was an amazing experience. There's probably, sorry, capacity was 100. There's probably 120,000 there in a 100,000 capacity. It was, <laughs> you never see anything like it. I mean, playing cricket in England, never, in India, never seen anything like it. So we'd won 16 straight. We hadn't beat India for 50 years. It's only been done once in the last 100 years or something. Mount Everest moment, three years later. I'll get to that. But... We've got we've made India follow on day three. We've got Sachin Tendulkar out in the second inning, so it's game over. Right. Michael Slade has organised a big box of um, Havana cigars <laughs> overnight. <laughs> Steve War had organised all this black market alcohol to celebrate because we're going to win. So the game's still going at this point. This is day three, <laughs> but Tendulkar's out. Tendulkar's yeah. out. It's all over. No, game <laughs> over, mate. So we're celebrating. Not only are we going to win our seventeenth straight Test match, but we're also going to beat India for the first time in fifty years or whatever. So it's all on. Anyway, next day, Raul Dravid 
and VVS Laxman come out to bat, you know, and Warney's, I mean, this, this rough Warney's spinning into the rough, it's fucking game over, it's all over. <laughs> they batted all day. They batted all flippant day. And I bowled the last over of the day. Did you? It got so desperate. I think everyone bowled, and I bowled the last over. None for three, I reckon, Sky. I can't what, remember. I think it was none for three what off What do you bowl? What, what are mm. they? How would you describe them? I'd say, um, see, there's a few cameras in here. There's a few microphones. I reckon they're better bowlers than me. <laughs> yeah, I reckon everything in this room is a better bowler than me. And I bowled this little... Although I did get Mike Hussey twice in club cricket, Scarborough versus Wanneroo, in swingers, LBW. Have you let him forget that? Or? No, no. And my, and Brad Hogg, I got him out. I got I bowled Jack Callis, the greatest all-rounder of our time, at the Gabba. In swinger, Gilly still believes it's the greatest ball he's ever seen in his career. <laughs> out swinger, out swinger, out swinger, in swinger, LBW. I also got Hansi Cronje in the same game, bowled him. Right. There's a bit of controversy about that with his, um, you know, with his pass. They mm. thought he might have given me the wicket, but oh, wow. anyway, you know, they, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> probably shouldn't have said that, but that's, 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 that's oh, the good. that's the word on the street. Um, but yeah, Scully, I, I was probably the worst bowler you've ever seen, but I have bowled in test cricket. That's one thing the three blokes in this room haven't done <laughs> besides me is bowled and over in test cricket. Okay. I've Professional met. test cricket. <laughs> I bowled test cricket as well. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had backyard test cricket, driveway <laughs> test cricket, <laughs> beach test cricket. Yeah, I'm hearing you, brother, but I'm telling you, I've actually bowled, yep. gave my baggy green cap to the umpire, <laughs> and yeah, yep. so there you go. I mean, yeah. talking about backyard cricket and beach cricket and all those forms of cricket, it, we would it be true to say that you 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 could perhaps be the the fourth, uh, at least the second best sibling in your family to play cricket? Mm. There was a brother of yours, Adam, that may have been a better cricketer than you. Yeah, it's a good point. And my brother's a classic, Adam. I love him. He's a very wise man. And when he played, he I think he won the he might still have the record at Aquinas College for the winning the 100 metre sprint wind sprint and he was the dude who they all the other seven blokes would have their spikes on their light crew and, and adam would rock up with his no shoes on and he'd just stand up and he'd just run and beat him and as a footy player as a gun as a cricket player he was a gun i remember playing a game at Fremantle oval stevens reserve and i had to go and bat for 20 minutes before stumps, a guy called Otis Gibson who's become a great, and he bowled flipping fast, right? So I had to go and bat for 20 minutes before stumps and he's bouncing the shit out of me and I'm getting smacked. And there's all this roaring at, on the other ground, watching the fourth grade. And there's my brother kept hitting him into the lake and they're all <laughs> laughing and all, everyone thought my brother's a legend. I'm getting smashed and badges of honour all over me. But that was my brother. Adam come home for um, my wedding with blonde dreadlocks and he'd been he'd worked on an ostrich farm for six months in Israel, I think. Then he worked <laughs> then he worked as a security guard in Amsterdam for six months. He was so flippin' talented, but he just loved having a durry, having a beer, having a bet and watching his two brothers play sport. And I've never met a bloke with more friends. He's a, just a ripper. He's a ripper, but he was certainly a very, very, very talented sportsman. Rumours say that you were just a bit of a plotter down at Abbott Park. He used to just nudge him off down to fine leg. Mm. And, <laughs> yeah. and Adam used to put him in the lake. Yeah, he'd smack him everywhere, mate. It was unbelievable. I, he was like, um, who would you compare him to now? Uh, he was a bit like the Chris Gale of of club cricket, fourth grade cricket or third grade cricket, whatever he plays. He used to belt him and oh yeah, used to take me an hour to get off the mark. He'd be 30 before I was zero, you know? So no, he was, he was talented. And he used to, the other thing about him, I remember two things about Adam. He, he, you know, he's a bit different, but he'd always be happy to be the poms. In backyard cricket, he'd always be happy to be the poms. So <laughs> I'd be Rodney Hogg and he'd be Jeff Boycott, right? Not because the way back, but he just, you know, if something was black, he'd say it's right. So he was happy to play for England. And like, are you joking? <laughs> Who would play for England? Anyway, he would be. Um, and he, he used to have this unusual... I mean, remember Kepler Vessels? Yes. And he used to have that really strange batting stance, right? And he'd go, no, I'm going to bat like Kepler Vessels. And everyone's going, mate, you can't bat like Kepler Vessels. You can't hit the flipping boy. He goes, no, fuck, I don't care. I'm batting like Kepler because it looks cool. <laughs> and he'd be smacking them all over the place. But he, he was wise too. I remember him saying to me, I'd say, mate, I want to get 30 test hundreds. He goes, oh, yeah, no worries, mate. How about getting your second one first? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, you can't get 30 till you got two. And then, uh, you know, a few months ago, mate, how about getting your third one? And he was just so smart, so wise. Always so had to wise. ground you. 
He was, yeah, he, <laughs> uh, abs- he still is, still is, always was, still is. And that's the great thing. You've got to have people, your family. I mean, this, in this world of social, I learned a great lesson from Sachin Tendulkar, the great Sachin. I think recently he, there's one and a half billion Indians. <laughs> one and a half billion. We've got, what, 24 million. One and a half billion. And recently he was still voted the most popular Indian in the world, right? And I said to him once in Adelaide, I said, Satch, how do you deal with it, mate? How do you deal with all this exposure and the pressure and, you know, people writing about you and talking about it and they, they worship you? He goes, he said, you notice I wear headphones a lot? I said, yeah, I do notice that. He goes, yeah, I listen, I love music. I said, all oh, right. He said, and I don't read the newspapers. I don't watch the TV. I don't listen to the radio. I said, what do you mean, mate? He goes, well, I don't know. I know how I'm going. I don't need strangers telling me how good I am. And then he said, more importantly, and I'll tell you the other thing, I don't need strangers telling me how bad I am. And it's such a great lesson in this world we currently live in with social media and media. And you don't need strangers telling people how bad you are. They don't know you. That's why you need your family and your friends to keep you grounded. That's who needs to tell you how you're going. <laughs> you know how you're going, but you don't need other strangers telling you that. And the interesting thing about the Sachin thing is that, you know, everyone says, I just don't read it. Oh, yeah, whatever, yeah, because you're going to hear about it anyway. But when it comes from Sachin Tendulkar, yeah. you listen. Yeah. I don't listen when people say, I just don't read it. Oh, fuck, whatever. When it comes from Sachin, and I, I learned that lesson, and, man, it is so liberating. I'm on no social media now, have, never have been, and because I would probably be dead now. If I had, because, you know, you, if you listen to... And, and I, I pray for my kids now. I've got teenage kids and kids who are a bit older now, but I don't know how they deal with it. I've got thick skin. I've been in the business a long time. It still affects me. I'm human. How's it going to affect 16-year-old kids or 17-year-old kids or 15-year-old kids? It is, it's so sad, mate. And I, you know, it's no wonder. We're getting a bit serious here. It's no wonder suicide is the highest killer between the age of 14 and 42 in our country, the lucky country. Can you imagine that? Because, you know, they probably listen to people who tell you how strangers tell you how bad you are. Do you do you reckon your time, you know, in, in an era of cricket, so you you know, you start playing in ninety three in the Australian side at least and you, you make your way through, you know, two decades of cricket as a player and then as a coach, have you seen that element ch- change players? But like, both as teammates and and players that you've coached. You know what you know what amazed me, um, Scoey? When I coached West Australia, I can't tell you how many men, well, young men and older men between 18 and 35 come into my office and cry. Seriously. like, And people go, what, what are you talking about? And it wasn't because they just come and told me their story. They're feeling under pressure or, you know, it's tough. And it's tough. They say, oh, they get paid a lot of money. Yeah, but they're still human beings. You know, so that's what I've noticed. Back in the day, I mean, you couldn't imagine. You're not allowed to express any of that. I mean, Alan Border was my first captain. Christ. <laughs> Alan Border's one of the greatest men of all time. I love him, but when he was playing and his cat, he was flipping tough. And so was David Boone. David Boone, they, they would not talk to me. It was almost like, <laughs> no, no, you, mate, you prove yourself. And they did not talk. The only thing <laughs> in my second, uh, third test... We're playing in New Zealand. Merv Hughes was bowling to Martin Crowe, the great Martin Crowe. Like, Martin Crowe was a genius. I was at bat pad under the helmet. Alan Border says, youngster, go out to deep backwards square leg. I said, no worries, captain. And I throw the helmet to the Ian Healy and I ran out there. First ball, Merv bowls a bouncer to Martin Crowe. Hook, hooks one straight to me. I'm so flipping nervous. Like, I'm under it. And I dropped the easiest catch you have ever <laughs> seen in your life. Like, it's impossible to drop it. It'd be like impossible getting out to your shit leggings. <laughs> anyway, I dropped this catch. Next thing I look up, AB takes his baggy green cap, throws it on the ground, he's kicking his baggy green, he's pointing at me like this. And I'm going, fuck, this is my hero, right? And AB is going, I'm going, cry. oh man, oh fuck, that was, my, that was my introduction. And that's what it was like. It was hardcore tough. And, you know, that's just how we were brought up. And that's how we were brought up. And, you know, at the end of my time with the Australian coach, and, you know, there was Chris, oh, he's a bit hard, he's a bit intense. And I'm going, man, that's just how we were brought up. And it's been so successful in Australian cricket for so long. You get on with it, you know, and 
I, I had Alan Border, and then I had Mark Taylor, and then I had Steve Waugh, man, the flipping ice man, and then I had Ponting. You would never fight Ponting in any world. No one. I don't, Bo, Bo Waters would not fight Ricky Ponting, and if he did, Pun would beat the shit out of him. You know how tough Bowie is, right? Yes. You're not beat. Joel Selwood wouldn't fight Ricky Ponting, I don't reckon. <laughs> I wouldn't fight Ricky Ponting. So they're my captains, right? And they are tough, hardcore Mate, they, and that's that was our grounding, you know, and that's and it was successful for so long. Yeah, you know, things change a little bit, but uh, the core values don't change, and that's really important to recognise. I think. What's it like getting your baggy grain, nineteen ninety three, Adelaide? Uh, well, it's a bit different because these days, you know, you get a. Um, you know, one of the old legends comes and presents the baggy green cap, and it's a real honour. If you're asked to present a bag, it's a real honour for the past players. Course, back, yeah. back then, mm. we're in Adelaide. I found out the day before, Damien Martin had been poked in the eye by Bobby Simpson in a training drill. You're kidding. No, and I, and I found out the day before. So at 9 o'clock in the morning, Tony Mann, the cricket manager of the Wacker, rang me and goes, mate, you gotta be, can you get to the airport in an hour? I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, marto has been injured. Doesn't look like he's going to play. Can you get to the... I said, Fuck, yeah. He goes, you're playing test cricket tomorrow. Like, I've been <laughs> dreaming of this moment since I was a kid. Since I was 11, actually, when Dennis Silly bowled Viv Richards on the last ball of the Boxing Day test, 1981. Oh, Kim Hughes got 100, my hero. And then DK bowled Viv Richards on the last ball of the flipping day. And that was when I wanted to play test cricket. So did, now it's happening. Did, didn't you make your first 100 with Kim Hughes's bat? Did I read that somewhere yes. in my research? Is no, that correct? Another good story. So your hero, you made your first 100 with his bat. Yes. Yeah, so my so old we'll man... we'll come back to the baggy grain. We'll come back to the baggy grain. My old man bought a Kim Hughes autograph a bat that he'd scored 100. They used to, you know, memorabilia at an auction way back then. <laughs> used to sit in my dad's study... And we all the boys would go up there and we're allowed to touch it. We're allowed to shadow bat, but it was not leaving my dad's study, right? Yes. Anyway, one morning I played at Sir, um, for Sereno Duncraig Cricket, Mary Reserve. I nicked the bat. I stole the bat out of dad's <laughs> thing. And I, I, I only told my dad this on his 21st, on my 21st birthday when I was 13 or 14 years old. Went to Mary Reserve and I thought, fuck, I got... It's like having a magic wand in my head. And it was a jumbo. I was, only, I was only a tiny kid. I had this big SS jumbo, right? I got my first 100. My first ever 100 was at um, Mary Reserves Sarah, with Kim Hughes. And I took it home, put it back in Dad's study, right? Like, I'm sure Dad must have known. But I told him on my 21st birthday, right? But, you know, the bat still sits in my cellar now. So I got this wow. awesome cellar. It's like the bat cave. Like, all the bats... You know, you have the autograph bats, all the teams you played with, and all the bats I've got hundreds with are all in my um, cellar. And with the old stumps, you know, you see in Test Creek, you pull out the stump, up, so all these, it's a beautiful room. But the first bat in the cellar is, and it's old and shitty now, but that was Kim Hughes's bat. Yeah, wow. that's how, 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 how it happened. He was my hero. And when I played my first A grade game, imagine this I was 15 years old, played at Floriad Oval. I was on the front, my, still one of my favourite photos, I was on the front page of the Sunday Times newspaper with Dennis Lilly. I was playing with Dennis <laughs> Flippin' Lilly, right? <laughs> guess what happened? I was at bat pad, silly mid on, Dennis Lilly, guess who he's bowling to? Kim Hughes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> bullshit. Kim Flippin' Hughes. Were you so playing or were you just running around? I was just playing, I was sitting there anyway. <laughs> it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a, I said it was a bit of a rainy day and... A second ball, I reckon, or third ball, plum LBW. Umpire gave Kim Hughes not out, right? Dennis is fucking steaming like he is flying in. And then, <laughs> oh, classic, Kim Hughes got 100. And they are, like, going at it like they are at war. Kim Hughes is charging at fight, you silly old prick. And Benny's <laughs> going, I'm going to fucking kill you. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there going, oh, my God, this is like... If this is cricket, oh, this is me, mate. And anyway, then then the next day, it was a Saturday-Sunday game, I'm batting, guess who bowled my first ball to me? Terry Alderman. <laughs> Terry <laughs> Alderman. It's like an all-stars game. This is, this, is, well, this is what club cricket used to be like. It used right. to be like waffle footy, right? right? This is what it used to be like. So Terry Alderman's running in to bowl to me, Kim Hughes at first slip. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, I'm living a dream. Oh, mate. So that was the, it, they were the days. Off to him? Oh, <laughs> they were the days. And I got out to, I think Tom, Tom Hogan got me out. Bat pad. I can't remember. I was too young to remember. But so yeah. back to the baggy grain. 
I mean, you, you strike me as a proud Australian and playing oh, yeah. for your country means everything to you. What's that like? Well, man, so these days you get presented. Back then, I, it was classic. I walk into the hotel the night before. So I got there, got on a plane, get across. And there I walk in at, say, at 5 o'clock. Bobby Simpson had picked me up. 5 o'clock the night before the game, I know I'm playing. And I walk in and there at the bar are all my heroes. Alan Border, David Boone. The War Brothers, Murphys, and they're all having jugs of beer, right? <laughs> yeah, the day before the test. This is the night before the test. <laughs> and I laugh now. So these days, I was changed. Like whenever I'm speaking, because oh, it's changed these days. Back then, they're all having jugs of beer. And um, these days, you know, the night before the game, they're meditating, they're spiritual healing, they're all beating their legs and polishing their <laughs> diamond earrings. <laughs> they're beating their yeah. legs. It's a bloody joke. Back then, it was like having a beer. But anyway, so I meet them all for the first time. These are my new teammates. And do you want to be, oh no, I better get upstairs because I've, I've got to play test cricket. Walk, and there's a big box and big box on my bed. And I had Justin Langus, Test Australian Test Cricket. And I'm like, fuck. So when you play, I open up my box and you get, I say, it's like Christmas. You get so much stuff, you know, like big box and there's shirts and. And at the bottom, and I used to say, and Warney's a bit, and Warney's box, he had pulled out blondes and mobile phones and all this. It never happened to me, Scully. Like, I'm just sitting there, I'm pulling out all this shit. Anyway, at the bottom of the box, there was a baggy green cap. Oh, and it wasn't just like... chucked it in there. I just chucked it, and it was at the bottom. I remember it was at the bottom of the box. I'm going, what the... Anyway, and I remember putting it on my head and I'm playing hook shots, reverse hooks, undid my buttons down to my belly buttons. That's what Dennis Lee and Rod Marsh, they said. I'm playing all these hook shots. and uh, But it was a proud moment. Yeah, very proud moment. And then I think um, probably more when Steve Waugh came in, there was a real emphasis on the symbol of the baggy green cap. And, you know, and we talked about it and... And it was a, yeah, it just become a really important symbol. And and as it turns out, my baggy Greg, I remember that Tony Gregg was critical of Steve Waugh towards the end of his career because he was wearing the bat and it was all tattered and torn and there was white coming out of the peak. And yep. But for me, it was the opposite. I thought it was like a masterpiece because the baggy green told the story. And, and my, if you, it's funny enough, I just got my baggy green cap. It's been to the Bradman Museum for the last 10 or 12 years. I just got, I just had it framed. And it stunk like you know there was, this, but it's got so many stories weaved into the fabric of it. It's not the, it's not like it's just, but it's just a symbol, and it tells so many stories of, of, the joy of getting having it for the first time, then the pain of getting dropped, and then the, you know, the celebrations and all the different countries we went to, and it's just to me, it's like a masterpiece. And the older it got, the the more magical it was. You know, it's nice to have a brand new baggy green cap, but actually, it's like um. You know, they talk about in martial arts, you have to start with a white belt and you never, ever wash your belt. And it, then it goes from a white belt to a blue belt to a green belt or whatever, and then a brown belt, and then the black belt, right? And then and at the end, you never you never wash the belt. Right. And it, the more you wear it, the more tattered and torn and dead, and that's the magic of it because it tells stories. And that's what I love about the sport, particularly cricket. There's so many stories. There's so many great stories. And there's a lot of stories in a, in any man's baggy green cap, whether he play, used wore it once or he, whether he wore it 150 times. There's so many stories in that. And I love that. So what was the, sorry, what was the rules around the, the baggy green? Like if you... Like if you lost it, were you in the shit or mm. is it just... Yes, yeah, so early doors, again, it became really interesting. Um, early doors, I remember you just to, you know, get get one and um, I reckon I've had a couple in my time because I, I, I know my dad's got one in his in his study and I know I gave one to Noddy Holder, my batting coach, at the end of my career. Like, um, And I'd known Noddy a long time. I gave him one as a gift. So I must have got him. Um, and then we had different ones like they had the... but And then I played... In 1993, and then I didn't play. Well, I played a few tests until 1998, um, and then that was the one I played 100 tests after that in that cap. So that's why it's tattered and torn and bloody smashed up. Because everyone thought when I got dropped the first time, most including my family, oh, he'll never play again. He's no good. <laughs> like he's useless. So, um, so they. So that's probably where I gave Dad that one. Um, and then we had one in t the year, the t 2000, which was the um, the little skull cap. Right. And it's the ugliest looking thing, but that's what they used in 1900. Like and then we had a, one, yeah, yeah, then had a federation. And it was funny because the 2000 one, I put it on against India. We're playing at Sydney and I wore it so I could wear it 
and I remember I just pulled it out and I wore it when I scored 100. So I was pretty pumped about that. Hey, right. so um, that, but I, I, the funny thing about that story was I got a hundred in that skull cap, and I got a hundred reverse sweeping. That's in the year two thousand, right? right? So don't, Noah, don't tell me you've invented the reverse sweep. Is that what you're about to go? No, with? I'm not going to say that. Although I was one of the first ones. You know, it's probably against the leggy too. That would have been the easiest <laughs> four I ever got in my life. But, um, but I reverse swept a hundred, and I used to run that the Justin Langer cricket game at Hale for twenty odd years, right? Two days later, I come home and we happen to have this camp going. And Dougie Walters, legend, like <laughs> legend, rogue. And he used to come and coach at, my, at the camp. Anyway, I rock up to Hale. I'm just feeling pretty good about it. I've got a test 100, feeling pretty good about myself. And Dougie, while he's got smoking his cigarette, he goes, uh, shook my hand. He goes, oh, how you going, mate? I said, oh, Dougie, good mate. How you going? He goes, Test 100 the other day. I said, yeah. What do you think? And I said, he goes, yeah, and you brought up a reverse sweep. I said, yeah, what do you think, Dougie? Dumbest thing I've ever seen in test cricket, he said. <laughs> Dumbest thing. I was, I was expecting Dougie Walters to go, you little beauty, do everything. Genius. That, genius. In between drags. <laughs> Dumbest. <laughs> Dumbest thing I've ever seen in Test cricket. That's, perfect. That's what he said. Oh, no worries. Talk about staying grounded. Now everyone reverse sweeps. Well, correct. You'd be lucky Swap not hands. to pull one out. So your first ball, though, you mm. come in at one for one mm. against West Indies, Adelaide, bowling some heat. Mm. I don't know who the player was. Ian Bishop. Ian Bishop. Mm. Smacked you in the head. Yep. And so we had Booney where you are mm. uh, a couple of months ago. Mm. I reckon he told this story as well. Mm. But you probably had a better view of what was going on. You copped it straight in the head. Mm. Welcome to Tex Cricket. <laughs> That's a great story. I, mean, I, I tell this every every corporate event now, and the story goes for 20 minutes now, Scully, so I'm not going to go on there, but I'll tell you what happened, just a very short version of it. I, I'd tell the story, and I'd get people up on stage with me, and I, I, I find the, the, the plumpest bloke with the biggest beard, and he comes up as Booney, and I, I'd bring the a prettiest lady up on stage and say, oh, the, you, you can be Keith Arthurton, because Keith Arthurton was silly, standing at silly mid-off. And I got bring Desmond Haynes up on stage with I got I've got Brian Lara at first slip, and I say, he's standing at about City Beach, first slip, and I got Ian Bishop, and Ian Bishop, and I say, hey, lady. No one left in the crowd I said, at this point. Ian, Everyone's on stage. Ladies, Ian Bishop, magnificent. Six foot ten Trinidadian, milk coffee colour skin, sparkling brown eyes, cr- built like Adonis. <laughs> <laughs> the girls are laughing. Uh, the problem is he's standing at about, if, if Brian Lowe is standing at City Beach, he's, starting at, he's standing at about Optus Stadium, I reckon. Calamunda. That's his run up, right? Calamunda. Yeah, Calamunda. <laughs> That's a, he's running from Calamunda to deliver this first ball. Anyway, he runs in magnificent specimen gets halfway through he's sprinting like Usain Bolt jumps up in there like a fire breathing dragon like all bully fast bowlers jumps up lands this ball smacks me straight in the back of the helmet right so I've gone down and when you look on the video like I actually got the boxer's knees like these days I'll be out for months yeah. with concussion that's it you're out protocols and that sort of shit so well I shouldn't say that I was very important Scully you know <laughs> but you. anyway so he gets I get hit I've got the boxer's knees and you know Desi Haynes has been shouting out he's scared Bishy he's scared Bishy and Keith Arthur's going, kill him, Bishy, kill him, Bishy. <laughs> and kill Bri- him. Brian Lara's at the back, you know, they're kissing his teeth like at my best in. <laughs> Boys should be in high school, not playing test cricket. And I'm going, oh, fucking, this is before. I say, oh, people reckon you got pressure at work. And I haven't even faced a flipping ball yet. So and then he bowls, hits me in the back of the head. I say, then the worst thing's about to happen. Don't worry about Desi Haynes. Don't worry about Keith Arthur. Don't worry about Brian Lara. Don't worry about Richie Richardson at second or Ian Bishop. Don't worry about any of them. The toughest man in the world, David Boone, mm. walks down, waddles down, puts his arm around me. I could still smell the Benson Hedges and PK <laughs> on his breath. <laughs> and PK. And I was always PK. Never ex- next, never None extra, ne- never just, no, 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 that was all, had to be PK, right? That was the routine. <laughs> anyway, he hits me in the head and Booney puts his arm around me. He says, hey, JL, no heroes in test cricket, son. Retire hurt. <laughs> I said, what? Retire. Retire? You want me to surrender? Walk? I said, Mr. Boone, if you don't Mr. mind. Mr. Boone. I've got mum and dad have flown over from Perth. I've got my brothers and my sister. I've got 
Oh. You want to get that demo? It's all right. Demo, demo will silence it. Oh, I've got JL will silence it. I've got, sorry guys, I've got, yeah. my, I said, that Mr. Boone, mum and dad have flown over. My brothers and my sister. I've got Bill Laurie and Richie Benno in the commentary box. I said, you know, the South Australians all hate me because I'm not a South Australian. I'm playing at Adelaide Oval. Desi Haynes thinks I'm scared. Keith Arthur wants to kill me. <laughs> Brian Lara says, I said, like, Mr. Boone, if you don't mind, we'll get through as heroes together tonight. He said, no, son, no heroes in test cricket. I said, okay. Anyway, I kept batting and I batted for 20 minutes before stumps. I was in the form of my life. I was zero, not out. Had still not scored a run in test cricket. Right? <laughs> Next morning, true story, look it on Google. If you don't believe me, look on Google. Kirtley Ambrose is running in. Not as magnificent for the, for the ladies as Ian Bishop necessarily, but six foot ten, Antiguan, poetry, unless you've got to face him, right? So he's running in, third ball of the morning, lands a ball, good length, pops up, hits David Boone right on the end of the elbow. This is flipping hurt, right? And when you get hit on the elbow, they hurt. But Scoey, not only am I very tough, love facing leg spinners and very talented. I'm also an opportunist. I undid my buttons down to my belly button. <laughs> I thought they'd already be down. <laughs> I waddled down, put my arms around Booney. <laughs> I said, Mr. Boone, no heroes in test cricket, son. Retire hurt. <laughs> he and with that, he, d- he looked at me with his puppy dog eyes. He said, I think you're right, son. And he did. No. <laughs> he retired hurt. No. The toughest man, mate, look on, look on up. <laughs> he retired hurt. Retire, walked off, re- booty, like oh man! I used to, I used to room. I, was a, I, was a, I don't know if he told you this, but I roomed with Booney in New Zealand, and his dad died of a heart attack um, suddenly, and we were rooming together, and uh, we formed a great bond after that, great friendship. I also remember Booney, and it's probably on the back of just telling me his dad had a heart attack every two hours back then. I used to wake up in our little room and you could see, <laughs> you could see the cigarette. Every, what, at every, night time, every, every two hours, every hour during the night, he'd just he'd wake up and he'd be, and we used to love, like with all this talk about Is sponsorship in, in sport. Huh? Is he just smoking in bed? Yeah, lying in bed smoking <laughs> and then putting it out next to this is uh, true as I sit here. And back in the day, like there was no, oh, do you mind if I have a cigarette? Just, no, no, straight in. Um, actually, ask me about talk about cigarettes. Ask me about Kerry Packer a minute. That's okay. a classic. But um, so Bernie, back and and back in the day, you know, there's all this talk about sponsorship in sport now and netball and cricket and AFL and you know these. Back in the day, Benson Hedges used to sponsor us, right? So you'd every Test match. Not only would the boys drink jugs of beer the night before. You'd walk into every day's play and there'd be four or five cartons of Benson Hedges <laughs> on the massage table, right? And the boys would go, and Booney, if he didn't get one whole one to himself, he would be spewing, right? So all the boys go, oh, here, Mr. Boone, you have your, you have your cart. And the boys would take... So it's just changed so much, hasn't it? It has changed is, so much. Oh, it's crazy. Tell me about... Who did you just ask me to Kerry. ask you about? Kerry. Oh, Kerry, what, what a great story. What a... Fl- oh, so it was after... We're playing the rest. We'd just been beaten in 2005 by In the Ashes. Could not believe it. Right? I still can't believe we lost that series, but we did. Anyway, come on. We've got to play the rest of the world at the SCG. Back that was one of the things. You know, they picked a world 11 versus mm-hmm. the Strikers. We are number one team in the world at the time, even though we'd lost. Anyway, uh, we train the day before the test, and Maddie Hayden says to me, hey, mate, you know what we're doing tonight? I said, no, what are we doing tonight? He goes, we're going to carry Packers for dinner. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, we're going to carry Packers for dinner. And and Hayden, look, our great mate Alan Jones, who texted me this morning, funny enough, Haydos, as only Haydos could do, he'd say, AJ, mate, you always talk about your mate KP. How about organising dinner for us? <laughs> and Alan Jones would go, yeah, no worries, I can do that. So anyway, Haydos says, we're going to carry Packers for dinner. I said, oh, classic, right? Eh? Never forget. We're out, come out of the hotel and there's, he's organised two Hummers, two black Hummers Is for it us. just you two? Hados and I, Brett Lee, Shane Watson. <laughs> <laughs> what a, and, so and, and, so and Steve Ward crew. comes. So anyway, how's this? Hados and I wear our suits, our Australian suits. Oh, this is the other thing I remember. Shane Watson and Brett Lee, the two young punks. Brett Lee's got torn jeans, a, like a white shirt. It was probably worth twice as much as our team. <laughs> and, 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 and actually... 
we're going, oh, fuck, no worries. We're wearing suits. We do the right thing. And these two young punks are wearing ripped jeans and shit. Anyway, we've got these two hummers. We rock up and we get to Bellevue Heights. That's where his house was. And a few things I remember. First, he shook my hand. And he had the hand the size of this table. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. He goes, oh, pleased to meet you, son. I said, oh, pleased to meet you, Mr. Packer. And it was like, because we'd heard all about him, right? Frightening. Then I remember walking, I remember <laughs> walk, walking in the entrance. He had this big black Buddha big black Buddha in the entrance of the house. I went, mate, impressive. I just somehow remember that. Then I remember, we, well, a couple of things happened. First, we're having dinner and we're all sitting, well, before dinner, we sit and he had these two young guys there serving us some drinks. Oh, you like it? Oh, you have a diet coke, test match tomorrow. He had an orange juice. And they brought out this, <laughs> this big platter silver platter with a packet of Benson and Hedges or a packet of cigarettes on it open and a big gold lighter, right? <laughs> Just a classic. <laughs> so he had an orange juice and he goes, and you know when you're now, if you have a cigarette, no, you're not allowed to have a cigarette, so you got to walk out, so you got to ask for permission or... Yes. He sat there and I remember taking out the cigarette. That was brought to him on a gold platter. Yeah, on a silver, it was a silver platter actually. Sorry. He had a gold lighter, big gold <laughs> ass lighter, right? That was fucking, like, the lighter was the size of this. <laughs> that was unbelievable. So anyway, he has this gold lighter and he sits this and he smokes this cigarette and he sort of looked at us and he, as he's lighting, he's sort of looking us all in the eyes as if to say, mate, this is my house, this is my castle and I'll do whatever the fuck I want, right? <laughs> and he's smoking a cigarette, he kept smoking cigarettes. Anyway. So then we're having dinner and he served, <laughs> he served, he served me peas. He's, Kerry Packer served me peas. Do, do, do <laughs> I was going to say, what was do, for dinner? Do, do, do you want some peas, son? I said, oh, yes, please, Mr. Pe put pe <laughs> Kerry Packer put peas on my flicking plate. Like, what a legend. And then he put some carrots as well. Son, you have some carrots, please, Mr. Packer. If you need them, you get a big game tomorrow, son. I go, yes, Mr. Packer. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> class. Anyway, we're sitting around the table and he says, no, boys, you know, luck's really important in life. I go, yeah, okay, Mr. Packer. Yeah, Miss Luck's important. And he started telling us about, first he told us about his great-grandfather finding a 10-pound note at the Hobart races. If it wasn't for that 10-pound note, boys, he got a 100-to-1 shot. He won his fortune at the thing. If he didn't find that 10-pound note, we would not be sitting here today. And we're going, oh, yes, Mr. Packer. <laughs> luck, luck. And he told us about the printing press. His old man's printing press and how Woman's Weekly was born. If it wasn't for that printing press, right place at the right time, we were bloody lucky. And if it wasn't for luck, we would not be sitting here, boys. I'm going, oh, yes, Mr. Pack, it's all about. And then he slaps me on the shoulder. <laughs> oh, he goes, had a bit of luck in your life, haven't you, young fella? I said, yes, Mr. Pack, I'm the luckiest prick in the world. I didn't know where he was going with it. He goes, you're lucky in life, son. Lucky they invented helmets or you'd be fucking dead. <laughs> <laughs> How good. I mean, and I didn't know where this is. And then by that, everyone's falling off their table and they're all laughing their heads off. This is Kevin Packer. And then, anyway, so that was classic. And the end of the night, Scoey, the greatest advice. Alan Jones says to Kerry Packer, what do you reckon, KP? You reckon they're, they're ready, these boys, for the most important... And Steve War had come by this stage. You reckon they're ready for the most important advice of their life? And Kerry Packer goes, yeah. Holy I, shit. I think they're ready. So you imagine, we are sitting there. What is Kerry Packer going to tell us? He's told us about luck. And the, he had this whole comment, there was not one word of bullshit spoken. It was brilliant. Anyway, we all sit there. What's he going to say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, yeah, I reckon they're ready. So we listen, listen. He goes, boys, in this life, as long as you know who you are, and your friends know who you are, the rest can go and get fucked. <laughs> and you know what? At the time we went, oh yeah, oh, it is so true. We go back to what we are saying about having people keep you grounded. Strangers don't need to tell you how bad you are, how good you are. As long as you know who you are and your mates know that the rest can go and get fucked. And, and I tell you what, it is unbelievable, especially in this world we currently live in, knowing who you are and who, you know, people have got your back. That's really important. That's a bloody good Huge. story. Mm. What 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 was the main course for dinner? You got peas and carrots. What did? Oh you yeah, we had. Mate, you, well, you imagine? You imagine we had prawns. We had some crayfish. I reckon. Is this the day steak. before the test again? 
You're not a fruit you both used to prepare it all. You just, you'd get <laughs> oh, seriously, yeah, like out whining and dining. And I drank, mate, I drank we on the waters? Diet Coke. Diet yeah. Coke and sparkling water. Yeah. yeah. I, and everyone's a bit different. But see, this we go back to how it was. I remember David Boone and Alan Border, I swear to God, every night would walk off the ground and the first thing they'd do, not have an ice bath, not have a protein shake, they'd have a stubby. Mm-hmm. And they would drink probably six stubbies every night. But they'd be in bed by, they'd go up to their room by eight o'clock. They'd probably go back to the bar, have a shower, go back to the bar, have a few beers at the bar. And then they'd be in bed by 8.30. They'd have a toasted sandwich or a club sandwich or something, a room service. They're in bed by nine. And then they'd do it over. And, and they were Alan Border until Punter was our highest ever run score. It was just routine, mate. Yeah. Routine, routine. So... And like I say, things have changed now, but um, it's a it's, cricket's a very different game than footy or the other codes. But yeah, we, we everyone did it a bit different. So you were in and out of the team from '93. So you debut in '93, but you're not a mainstay by any stage. Nah. You you know play five tests over sort of five years sort of areas, mm-hmm. um, but you come back into the team towards the back end of that period, so like '99, '98, yeah, '98, yeah. Um, do you use the period of time where you're out of the team and you're, you're battling and you're trying to f- score runs and you're trying to fit in with blokes and trying to impress people mm. f- further down in life when you're be- when you become the coach? Um, oh yeah, that was a that was a crucial part. I played three tests in five years, but I went on most of the si- on most of the tours, and I learned so much from Steve War from um, Ricky, but all those guys. I did, and I watched, I watched, and. You, you, Johnny Wilkinson, the great rugby union player, he was once interviewed by Michael pa- Sir Michael Parkinson. I'll never forget what he said. He said, why were you such a great player, Johnny? He said, Michael, you are the change room that you walk into. I was in a great change room. And I would say that I was so lucky. I was always in, you know, I had those great captains. I had amazing people to watch. And Steve War, you know, I talk a lot about Steve War, but in that time he wasn't captain for a lot of it but he was a run machine mate he would make 100 after 100 and I wanted to be like that so I'd watch him I'd watch him prepared I'd talk to him he, that, you know those guys are the greatest sports psychologists in the world because you watch you listen you learn so by the time I did come back in I'd learned so much and I was ready I was ready and one of the big mistakes I learned early was for the first part of my career I was always trying to show Mark Taylor and Mark Wall that I could bat don't ask me what was those two but I thought they thought I was rubbish and, uh, and it's already hard enough as it is, but I was trying to show them. And it was, I was putting myself under so much pressure just to show those two I could bat. And that's a great lesson in itself. And often the harder you try, the worse it gets, right? So by the time I did come back in, I reckon I had a nice foundation. You needed a bit of luck because it was, a, mate, it was arsy. And then I got dropped again in 2001 for the first Ashes test. And the only reason I played as an opener, people remember me as an opener with Hados, because they dropped Michael Slater for diff- whatever reasons. And I'd, I hadn't never opened before. Now I'm an opening batter. And I thought it was just, oh, it's a one-off chance. I'm going to have fun, you know, mate. Oh, they're gonna, they'll bring Slat straight back in for the first test of the summer. They're just giving him a bit of a wake-up call. Anyway, on seven, I, got, I hit a beautiful pull shot. I got caught an absolute, the arsiest catch that silly mid on by Mark Ramprakash, right? Spewing, that's the end of my career, walking off, no ball. Andy Caddick about a no ball. Really? Luck. There's the Kerry Packer luck thing, right? So I guess, and I end up getting 100. And you go three back to bat? Yeah, and then, then and then, so they picked me. They probably felt sorry. Well, we can't drop him now because he, first ball of the first test back, very first ball at the Gabba, Chris Cairns ran in bold, big in swinger, plum LBW. It was like <laughs> literally... And Daryl, um, Daryl Harper, yeah. the umpire, yeah. Umpire Daryl Harper, yeah. Gave me not out. It was like, he must have just forgot to have his coffee that morning. It was, it was, a, it was unbelievable. No, not none out. None of these ones. Back, not, back then, no, <laughs> no referrals. Challenge. It was, at, anyway, I smacked 100. Next test, I, I'm playing at the Hobart, so I've got back to back now, a bit weary. I cut one to a guy called Mark Richardson to point. He dropped the easiest catch you've ever seen in your life, right? 
Anyway, it's, and it's still to this day my fate, and I take the piss out of Hados. Because I was on, that day I said to Hados, I'm a bit weary. I said, I'm just going to go for it, mate. He goes, yeah, just go for it, mate. <laughs> anyway, I was on 60, and he was on three. 60 not out and three. It's my favourite fight. It's in my bar. Langer, 60 not out. Hados, three not out. And I, he probably he beat me to 100 at the end. But, but it was because I was just t- and But I, I got dropped on five. Anyway, another 100. And it's just how life works, right? You need a bit of luck. So luck. Hmm. Kerry Packer theory. You, but you, I agree with luck. But, I mean, you, if we go through the most career first class runs by Australians, number three, Alan Border, number two, Don Bradman, mm. number one, mm. Justin Langer. Mm. It's not luck. Yeah, yeah. And so, so Haydos actually asked me, Haydos was over for dinner last Saturday night. We sat around the fire pit and smoked a cigar and talked. He's the most serious hippie in the flipping world, mate. I love him. But he is, mate, he's intense. And we talk some deep shit, really deep stuff. But he, and we talk about something and he said, why do you, how, why do you reckon you made so many runs, mate? This is Haydos, my mate. We should have been talking about music and footy and whatever. And I said, ah. Oh, I don't know what he goes, oh, I don't know, what do you reckon? And I said, um, oh, just hunger, hunger. He goes, really? He goes, yeah, I was, I was just so hungry, mate. And when you're hungry, and I loved it, I love training, I love training. So you're hungry, you set your goals, and I think hunger, and that gets you, kept me going. And, I, and then I said, also, I was fascinated by concentration. I was more interested towards most of the back end of my career in the art of concentrating than I was on the cover driver, the pull shot or the cut. So you had to work on those things, but concentration, especially in batting. So I, I think I learned about concentration and I was hungry and I, I prepared well. And I always say in any field, if I could give anyone advice, and I spoke to some kids the other day, two words, be prepared, be prepared, be prepared, be prepared, be prepared. Be, it doesn't matter whether you're writing, you're speaking, you're... you're Exams, you walk into a test match, be prepared, be prepared. And if you do, that takes a lot of pressure. And I was always very well prepared. So I was, but also perspective. Like it probably took me 5,000 games to go past the Donald Brown. It probably took me 50 games. But it's it's still, it was a nice, um, yeah, it's a nice thing to have in the CV. Oh, I'm not. I'm not the world's biggest cricket fan. I love cricket, but I didn't. I certainly didn't know that before actually having a look at it. So, I just, I think luck has an element. Not to challenge Kerry Packer, but no, no, of you, course, of I course. I know you not need, say, I know. You get dropped, but then you still need to go make the run. Correct. Yeah, no, of course, and and we you say, but but it's but and it's really interesting in life. You know, there's the old saying: the harder you work, the luckier you get. We've all heard that, right? But I've got a different take on that. I say the harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. So therefore, when opportunities come up, you grab them. Because if you're if you've worked hard and you've prepared well and you really want it, and you're not giving it, and I used to, well, I might have talked to West Coast a few years ago, and you're there, and I used to have this, excuse the language, I had this fuck you attitude when I was out on the cricket field because they're trying to take my living away from me, they're trying to take my dream away from me. So I'm not giving, I'm not surrendering that. Hmm. I am not surrendering that for one second and therefore you had to learn how to concentrate you had to learn how to have a good technique you had to be physically fit and strong you had to have courage physical courage um, and but you also had to balance that with with the spirituality of being happy as well because if you're tight and tense and, and uptight and trying too hard it's no fun so you had to balance all those things out to get luck um, or to have such a privileged life that we've been able to have so um, so they go hand in hand, but and you say it sort of um, almost flippantly. Oh, you need luck, but yeah, there's there's a lot more to it than that. You hold the record, I think, it's still current record for the slowest century by an Australian, three hundred and eighty-eight minutes. Is that right? Yeah. Do you know what game it was in? No. With, with that, I think it's a game that you've got fond memories of. Perhaps like some of your greatest memories. Mm. It's in a two hundred and thirty-eight run partnership with Gilly. Oh yeah. Um, what a test match! Yeah, oh. 388 minutes. Like when you put it into hours, that's how many hours? That's six five, hours. That's six over hours. six hours. That's yeah. insane. Well, what about this? My my third test match, and I say this is impossible to believe. I was batting three. I scored. I was 64 not out overnight, and I batted for about five and a half hours. That was the start <laughs> of my test. Can you imagine doing that today? Is that in that game? No, no, that's my third test oh. of my career. So I was, oh wow! And then I got dropped after that, and two things happened. I got dropped in my last test, but they were picking the Ashes in '93, and I got a duck in both innings. So I'm the end of the world, you know. And they're picking the Ashes, do I? And there's a guy called John Wright, who 
he's a he played just played his hundredth test. His opening batsman, tough New Zealander, right? A bit of a hippie as well, a bit like Haydos. And at the end of that test, he walks up to me and he's got a stubby in his hand and a cigarette, and he says, um, "I've been watching you, son." I said, "Oh yeah." He goes, "You're trying way too hard. You need to relax, mate." I'm going, "Okay, Mr. Wright. Yeah, thanks. Great advice. <laughs> what does that mean?" And then he says, um, oh, I, "I'd like to offer you some advice." He said, "I think you should learn transcendental meditation." <laughs> and I, la- <laughs> I laughed. I said, "Oh yeah, transcendental what?" Transcendental meditation. And I said, oh, "Okay, thanks for your advice. Great advice, Mister. I'm just about to get dropped from the ashes, and the world's about to fall. And you're telling me about a thing called transcendental meditation." Anyway, I got dropped. I'm sitting at home at Mum and Dad's house, the little round table. I open up the West Australian newspaper, big advertisement learn transcendental meditation and i went and saw this guy um derek from smythe road claremont learn transcendental i've meditated every single day since have you yeah meditated this morning for 20 minutes before i came here meditated every day since do, do most people when you tell that story like react like oh my god meditation do yeah you know, surprise yeah do, do you know 2018 story with west coast around meditation and mindfulness no do you know that no so um we, we practiced mindfulness like four times a week in 2018. We had 25 blokes that would sit down and meditate. Mm. Mm. You, you know what it is. Like yeah. mindfulness. And like I, whenever I talk about stories about 2018, the, the only reason we won that game was because of our uh, – we had a mental pathway in order mm. to go past adversity, which was awesome. being down by five goals – um, in the second grand final in three years where the same thing had happened to us three years prior mm. where we didn't have the, the mental tools to deal with it in 2015. It was like, mm. shit, biggest game ever, 100,000 people, mum, dad, family, flown over, everyone's off paid for everyone's accommodation and we just capitulated. Whereas 2018, of the 22 players that played, I reckon 19 were like three or four times a week mm. med- awesome. meditators' mindfulness. Mm. So I did know about the meditation stuff. I had it in my notes to ask you about, yeah. but it doesn't awesome. look shock me particularly because yeah. it's mental. I think we have to – see, what I've never understood is that people I say, especially in cricket or batting, it's such a mental game. Mm-hmm. Everyone says that. Oh, it's 90% mental and 10%. All oh, right, but we don't do any work on it. It doesn't make sense. Mm. So, um, so I learned that that was important and it's a huge part of my life now. Has been for since '93. So what's that? Uh, Twenty nine years ago. Is that right? Yeah, that yeah. sounds right. Does that so make I've been you feel mad- old or? pretty much. Yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> old now, mate. But then, um, then another thing happened. I got dropped, and then I went back to the cricket academy, and Rod Marsh said to me, "Son, it's not about how long you bat for. It's about how many runs you score. We're going to turn you a little slogger." And then that changed everything after that. And I learned, and whilst that innings was a tough innings uh, in uh, against Pakistan, I didn't know it was the slowest test hundred. Um, but, yeah, I mean, my whole life changed around that period, my cricket career. I started learning about concentration through meditation. And, and then Rod Marsh said, no, no, come on. It's time to start slogging, mate. And it was so much fun. And then the game changed. And everyone thought I'd become a more aggressive player when I started opening with Hados, but I would always argue, besides some outliers like Pakistan, which was the best innings of my life, funnily enough, mm. um, that I sort of sort of changed. I had to change if I wanted to keep playing Test cricket. Is it, it? Do you sort of have like this idea then, like you, you're maybe less careless with your wicket then like if you're going out to do you have to sort of let go of that like i can't get out can't get out because then yeah. but if you sort of release if they're like he's just going to go out hit it if he gets out gets out but the benefit is that he might hit 150 there's always um as i said those two words be prepared are really powerful the other two really powerful words in life are let go and you have to let go because the harder i always say if you watch muhammad ali box does he look tight and stressed? He is like he's like a he, he's a like butterfly. a butterfly. He like is, yeah. He's like a butterfly, and he's like a um, his arms are like a hose in a swimming pool. You know, they just and if, if you watch Tiger Woods swing a golf club or Roger Federer he played, no, no, they they're loose and all the great players. So you've got to learn to let go physically. There's a it's the ultimate paradox. A, a sports psychologist told me this years ago. The ultimate paradox to have a hundred percent control. You've got to let go of all conscious control. 
And that's so flippin' scary. Imagine a bloke running in to Bolt here, 150 kilometres an hour, and you're saying, just let go, mate. <laughs> no, no, your body wants to hop, but you do. If you get balance in your stance and you let go, because what happens is soon, and I, uh, is this going to sound get a bit technical, but a really important part of my body was that joint in my wrist, because if I let go of that, then my forearm would be soft. And if my forearm was soft, my shoulders would be soft. If my shoulders, my face would be relaxed. And then your whole body can dance. If you're holding on tight, that gets tight. Your shoulder gets tight. Your face, and you try, and nothing can move. Nothing moves. So you've got to learn. And you talk about we go back to luck or, or runs or success. You've got to learn that. You've got to learn to let go. You've got to learn to relax. You've got to learn to concentrate. It's not we're not born with it. So you learn to do it. <coughs> And the more you do it, then you get become successful at it and then you want more of it. It's like, oh, it's like this thing early, oh, I can't let go. But then you do and you realise you move faster, you see the ball earlier, you get into better positions, you hit the ball harder, you hit the ball further. You've got to learn that stuff, right? It doesn't just happen. Um, and that's the great thing about um, having a curious mind and wanting to get better. One thing I, that's almost tattered in my soul from Alan Borton. If you get out of bed every morning looking to get better, you'll get better and we will get better. And that's like an awesome philosophy, right? And I know that we used to make that a bit public and we were winning 16 straight tests and you could see the opposition going, what the f- how are they going to get better? <laughs> this is scary, but we had that. We're going to keep getting better. We're going to keep getting better. We're going to keep- And that was led by our captains. That was led by Steve Waugh, then Ricky Ponting. And then, and if you do that, then you have a curious mind of always looking to get better. We used to, we're in that period of great success with the Australian, we had a philosophy, the road less travelled. We're going to do things different than everyone else does. And you can say, for example, we never had night watchmen. Every team has a night watchman because it's the soft option. We never had night watchmen. We played a game, I'll never forget this, we played a game in Dubai it was 40 degrees and it was 90% humidity. Our bowlers were bowling two overs at a time. Andy Bickle, the f- fittest human being on earth, he was coming off having an ice bath and they were bowling two over spells. It was that hot. You know what we did? Steve Waugh said in the leading up to the game, you know what we do, boys? In between overs, we are running between overs. And we're going, you're crazy, mate. He goes, no, no. We will destroy Pakistan's soul if they see us between overs, like you do in Australia. We're going to run between overs to get and be ready for them. We did that, and we won both test matches in two days, two and a half days. We destroyed those because the road less travelled. It takes courage to do that. I remember John Buchanan used to say, boys, we're going to score 400 in a one-day game. And a lot, there's a lot of resistance to that because boys are going, mate, because you've got to be selfless. You've got to be fearless. You've got to go for it. It's all got to be about the team. And it turned a lot of people off. But I was in Johannesburg the day Australia got 400 against South Africa. Right. Yeah. And the boys then were high five and hugging John Buchanan. We never thought it could happen. But then the other funny thing that happened, like the four minute mile, guess what happened straight after? South Africa beat it. I was going to say, didn't South Africa win? First time it ever happened. South Africa <laughs> won the game. They also went past 400 and they won the te- they won the game. It's, it's like freaky stuff. But that's how, how powerful the mind is, um, Scott. We've got no idea. But we've got to learn to use it and then release it. And then um, if the, the, the greats in anything, they, that's what they learn to do. What about the ashes? I haven't spoken about the ashes at all. Yeah. Is, is that a stupid question to ask? Does it mean more than anything else, the ashes? Like... Uh, to, to the yeah, players? Yeah, no, I, I think it, playing India now is huge. Yeah. But the Ashes, yeah, the Ashes. I mean, it's very romantic for us. I remember getting up, mum and dad used to make hot milo and we used to be able to watch, you know, like Wimbledon back then, you know, we used to watch the black and white tally and watch the, the Ashes. Um, I remember, you know, the both of them. There's just so many great stories about the Ashes. And, uh, yeah, there's something special about it. What I do know, when you play in England, if you're not winning, like we did in 2005, it is the most um, – I can't remember a more stressful series than that because the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, the poms are all over you and it's got nothing to do with out in the cricket field. It is – and the media over there, the media in England are about uh, – the media in Australia, although it's getting more brutal, is probably three out of ten compared to the England media. They're ruthless. You just cannot escape it. It's like – and it's I say this with respect. Well. Oh, so tabloidy, you know. And we're actually last Ashes series in England 
we uh, we banned no no on our team bus no newspapers no newspapers in the change room because what can it what can it be good for oh yeah but jl some of us like to read it yeah yeah that's good mate but what can it be good for tell me what it can be good for and we'll do it so we banned that um but it's tough. Ashes cricket's tough, but it's also and there's that great rivalry. There's there's that great history, and it's still big. The Barmy Army. <laughs> <laughs> oh. He must out. He must have copped some. Oh, what about this, Scoey? I get 250. It's a great lesson. 250 Boxing Day Test 2003. Yep. Smacked it. One of the great moments in my life because I hit, I hit a six to bring up a hundred, and it was one of the only times in my life I knew something no one else in the world knew because I hit the ball. I knew it's going for six, and for whatever the time it goes, hit the bat to clear it. I knew it's going for six, right? But no one else. They're all oh, watching, watching, and they all erupt. But I'd already erupted. But I knew <laughs> something. But anyway, I remember that. Anyway, two hundred and fifty. I'm feeling like Viv Richards, you know. And we had to bowl before stumps. And every time Brett Lee bowled, the Barmy Army were calling no ball because they say it's for chucking. Right. So they're going ball, and, and anyway. <laughs> <coughs> we go to the press conference. I, I strut in there like Viv Richards. I got 250 in a test match. They're like Boxing Day test match. How <laughs> cool am I? I'm the greatest player on earth. Walk in and they asked me about, you know, you mean, and they said, oh, what about the Barmy? I said, oh, the, yeah, the Barmy Army. I'll tell you about the Barmy Army. Most of them are 40 or 50 kilogram overweight idiots who know nothing about cricket. You know, and the way they call it, big mistake. <laughs> Next day, I always under the radar. They're singing the Seven Dwarf songs about me. They've, they've, <laughs> they've come up with this song about being 50 kilos overweight, 40 kilos <laughs> underweight, 30 kilos underweight. Oh, Langer, you're a knob or something like that. <laughs> so anyway, so the Barmy Army. And, and, and the truth is, as loyal as they are to England, I'm as loyal as to my teammates. So I'm going to stick up to my mates. But... I have great respect for the Barmy Army because they are there and England went through lots of periods where they didn't win much, especially against Australia, and they were still there singing all day. The only thing is, I will say, is some of the stuff they sing, it's funny to everyone else except for the people they're singing about who are usually your mates. So that can be pretty brutal. So uh, we could talk cricket forever. There's probably a thousand stories, but to finish your cricket career, you, you retire with, I've, I've heard you speak about it, you retire with the great Shane Warne, mm. Glenn McGrath. Um, what's that moment like when you decide to retire? Because, because I, I, it, With it, my it, mate David Boone, who we're talking mm. about, I, I remember it clear as day. We'd just been, I got hit in my 100th test match. Bad, first ball in my 100th test, I got knocked out. Didn't play any more role in the game. So we, we come back to Perth and Noddy hold him about, he, he picked me up to go and have a coffee or for some lunch and he pulled over the side and he got really emotional. He said, it's time, mate, it's time to give up. It was like the trainer throwing in the tower. I said, Nod, mate, I've promised the boys we're going to win the Ashes back. We lost in 2000, we're going to win the Ashes back. He goes, okay, well, we're going to get to work. And that was a really hard time because I had to get back this confidence to see the ball, the short ball. I knew that England had come at me. Anyway, um, we, we've done, and I literally did everything humanly possible to be ready for that series. And then we get to the fourth test match and we're 3 0 up. We get to about day, or we get to day four, we're about to win 4 0 at the MCG. And Booney was in there, he was a selector at the time. I said, Oh, Booney, I've got something to ask you, mate. I said, hey, Mate, tell me about this, uh, this retirement thing. He goes, Is it on your mind, son? I said, Yeah, a little bit. He goes, You're a lot closer than you think. I said, oh, I really didn't think anymore. We win the test, and I was the the song master. So I had to get up, and two things happened that night in the change room. We, you know, we're sitting around drinking beer and having a great time and celebrating. And I remember I had to get up and sing the team song, and I kept thinking I'd much rather be home with Sue and the kids back at the hotel. So that was interesting. And then I was sitting with Haydos, and Haydos had this burning desire to get back in the T20. You know, it's a bit of a clear. He had the eye of the tiger, mate. He was desperate. And I thought, we've just, gonna, we've just beat in England 4-0. We'll probably beat them 5-0. I've done everything in my power to be ready for it. What else am I going to play for? I just knew. I knew. And I retired the next morning. Mm. I retired the next morning. So I just knew. And it's funny because the year later, I was still playing for WA and Gilly rang me up. And I was at a c cafe. I was having my breakfast. And Gilly rings me. He goes, mate, first thing, mate, I thought you are a bullshit artist. I said, what do you mean? 
He said, you always told me you're going to wake up one day and know it's time to retire. He said, that was never happening to me. Happened to me yesterday. I'm retiring today. He just know. I just think you know. I think you honestly, your heart, your gut tells you it's time. One of the tough, and you'll know this, um, Scoey, in sport, I think the hardest thing about sport is probably 10% of players get to finish in the Cinderella story. Joel Salwood's Cinderella story. Yeah. I finished 5-0, beating the Poms 5-0. I'm batting with Matthew Hayden. We hit the winning runs together, walk off. Doesn't happen, mate. I was so lucky. It didn't happen in my test in my coaching career, but it happened. And it doesn't it happens to probably five percent of sports people. So everyone's got a bit of an axe to grind. Right through. You gotta let it go. But I was lucky. I can say that. But that's I was lucky. I was so lucky. I live I finished with a Cinderella story. And I'm for that I'm so grateful. I finished I finished I was I don't think I've ever told this on this story. I was I was in the uh, dug out in the race. I'd been dropped for the final against Collingwood 2020. Um, very strong believer I should have played in that game at that time and mm. now I don't really care, but at the time I was... I remember seeing you. Staunchly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do remember seeing that. Mm. And, yeah, I stood in the race by myself, watched the last play. So West Coast had the ball. They were going back inside 50. We were down by under a goal. And the ball got smothered. Tommy Cole got smothered, and career was over. Mm. I got when sat back in the change rooms by myself. So yeah. that's that's yeah. what you're talking about, and right? And you know? Oh no, I'd already I'd I'd said that I'd retired. I'd said that was my last year. Right. But that was that, that was, was a knockout yeah, final. Yeah. That was it, yeah. career over. It yeah. was like, yeah, I wasn't in the middle hitting the runs, celebrating mm. with my mates mm. down the change room. And, and like, having a cry. you imagine this, and this is going to get aired in a little while and uh, this is a beautiful thing about we don't know what's happening in the future right but today as we ta- Australia are playing Afghanistan in the T20 World Cup at the Adelaide Oval at 4 o'clock this afternoon Aaron Finch is he going to play is he we'll know when this is this is comes on air we'll know whether he played with it whether they go on and win the World Cup or they don't win the World Cup but these are the things that go on in, in athletes' minds, right? So Aaron has just got a slight hamstring problem. Is he going to play? If Australia don't win tonight and win well and England beat uh, – who are they playing? Uh, Is it New- Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka tomorrow – Australia could be out of the World Cup. It could be Aaron Finch's last game. Mm. And this is the sort of stuff that goes on in people's mind. And then you've got to go out and perform as well. Mm. And that's the point. It's like it can be over like that. And remember, you remember this, Scoey. When we're young, they go, oh, you know, take it all in. It's over before you. It can blink, da-da-da. And then actually it is. It's over before you blink. It goes so quick, right? So, you know, it's, uh, it's, they're lessons for young men but or young women, but... You know, it's hard to sometimes recognise that when you're in it. So you move out of the game, you retire, you move into coaching. Um, mm. I've heard you describe coaching Western Australia as your dream coaching job. Um, you leave that, and mm. again, we, we probably just skimming over a bit of it, but you leave that to come in to coach the Australian cricket team uh, during the sandpaper gate, sandpaper yep. scandal. Um, do you remember what you were doing when... Uh, that incident actually happened? Clear as were you, day. Were you with the team? Clear as day. No, no, I was coaching West Australia and my wife was over in London surprising Jessica, my eldest daughter, for her 21st birthday. She was living in England and uh, I'd been out for something to eat with, the, with my other three daughters, come back and we're sitting on the couch and the cricket was on South Africa versus um, Australia and it was just before the tea break or lunch break. I'm sitting on the couch with Gracie and they had this scene where there was this hand going down into his pants with something yellow in his hand. And I said to Gracie, pray that's not Cameron. She goes, what do you mean, Daddy? I said, just pray it's not Cameron. And I knew it was Cameron because he's bangers like Kerry Baker, big hands. And I said, oh, mate, what have you done? And then I looked up and then they showed the whole incident and I listened to what had happened. And I had no idea. And then... Um, Sue texted me from London, what's happened? I said, oh, babe, you've got no idea. Then the next morning I went to the Frio markets and that's when it struck me. I've been going to the Frio markets with Ali, my hippie daughter, for the last 10 years. And we just have our gosleme and drink our coffee with Tim and talk shit. 
this day, I reckon there's 50 hippies from the markets come up. And, What's happened? Australian cricket, they're crying, they're angry. I went, whoa, shit, this is serious, right? And then I went and got Cameron Bancroft from the airport and we were going down to Mandra for Easter and I put it off a few days with the kids, going down to Mandra for Easter, picked up Cameron Bancroft from the airport and then drove down to Mandra. As I'm walking in to have my first corona, it's been a big week, Swampy Marsh rings me up. He goes, mate, are you watching the TV? I said, what do you mean? Put the TV on, quick, put the TV on. So I go, okay, so I put the TV on. Haven't even had a corona yet. Haydos says, uh, there's Darren Lehman resigning in tears. And I went, oh. And then all the girls are going, ah, oh, what does this mean, Dad? I said, oh, because now it's no longer hypothetical. Darren Lehman, the head coach of Australia, has just resigned. And the kids sort of go, Sue goes, oh. And then it sort of went from there. I got appointed. And then, yeah, the, the rest is history, as I say. <laughs> the rest is history, right? So during that week, was your name thrown around like if? If Darren was to well, that, that, that my name had been thrown around for a, a year before because I actually took the team to West Indies. Darren had a tour off, and you know, Scorchers had been very successful. WA had been going well, and my name had been. But I always thought oh, maybe in three or four years' time it might be something that happened a lot quicker than I expected, um, and then it did. You know, there was no interview. But I just went through, had a couple of conversations. Um, with the CEO and the chairman and the high performance manager and then I was appointed. So it all happened very quickly. But then what happened next was that the C the chairman finished, the CEO finished, the high performance manager finished, the head coach resigned, the captain and the vice captain. So the leader a big vacuum in in leadership and it was that was a really, really, really tough four years. So did you feel like you were tasked on changing the culture or improving the culture and leadership? Or hundred percent the first no, the first year, I remember the champs, I don't care if we didn't win one game. We've got to change the... And that's where we, the three words, make Australians proud, become born. And I said those words every day for four years, publicly and privately. Because I'd say to... I could say to any of you, Pat Cummins or Cameron Green coming for his first test or um, Tim... Pa it doesn't matter. I said, boys, if you wake up every day making your mum and dad or your grandparents or your brothers and sisters or your mates proud... We'll be okay. You'll be okay. We'll be okay. Think about that. And they don't want to see you lose every week. So you've got to play well, but you're also got to be a good person. Yeah. It's a really simple philosophy and it's a really powerful philosophy and it, and it worked well for us. Is winning the Ashes, what, what's the difference between winning it as a coach and as a player? Well, nothing replaces playing, Scully. Nothing replaces playing. I've said that. And, and actually what happens is, when you're, when you're a player, in our case, you've got 10 other mates there and you're playing with your mates and you're trying to you know, make people proud and, and you're trying to win the Ashes and, it's, and afterwards you sit back and you relax, you celebrate. And when you're a coach, you're not just with your 10 mates. You're, you've got all your staff, you've got all the players, you've got all you're keeping an eye on what's happening around the whole system. And even if you win, you go, okay, so what, what's going to happen tomorrow? We got to get up tomorrow. We got to get guys organised. We have training organised, and it is just, it is a tiring job. And there's, so there's no comparison to playing. There is no comparison to playing. Coaching is cool. And and the other great lesson I learned, and I actually went for the 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 job when Mickey Arthur got the job. I was one year into coaching, and everyone said, "Oh, you know, good leader, you know." But, and I went through this process, and it was full on, but I wasn't ready. I'm thank goodness I didn't get the job. And that apprenticeship of six or seven years at Wacker was just gold for me. I wouldn't be, I'd probably be dead now if I hadn't have been through that and go, those four years with the Australian cricket team. Mm. So I learned that lesson. The other thing I learned was when I got the job, I remember um, Pat Howard, the high performance manager, said to me, JL, managing down will be easy for you, but managing up is the, ta you know, whether it's the boards or the um, managing up is, and I, I was, but what I've learned is, now, you've got to manage up, you've got to manage sideways, you've got to manage down. And especially, you know, there's a lot of, the players have got a lot of, um, with the players' associations, and the players now have a great deal of say. We've seen it in the last few years with the sponsorship stuff. We see it a lot. So you're now managing all up, down, sideways, and that is tiring. That is exhausting. 
um, and you can't play, you try and please everyone, you please no one, right? So I learned that lesson. And when you're a player, my job was to score runs. So I'd get up every day and I'd be programming my body and my mind to make runs because if I made runs, it helps the team, team out. So in a sense, my life was really simple. And when you win, you celebrate. When you lose, yeah, you know, you, you commiserate with your mates. But when you're a coach... It's not that simple. I'm just going to make runs. You've got to try and look after everyone. And that's so hard. Managing people is so hard. Tim Payne's put a, <clears throat> excuse me, Tim Payne's just released a book mm. and um, he's detailed a conversation he had with you mm. um, and he's labelled it the hardest conversation he ever had as a player. Mm. But he also detailed what you had to say back and you appreciated the honesty he gave you. He was speaking about some of the players' thoughts and your coaching mm. style and mm. the environment of the club. Mm. Um, I just found it interesting. Like, so your your response, and you can tell me if it's right or wrong, was sort of uh, no, no one's it ever. It was a relief, yeah, mate. No one's ever been a, that honest. Because I, to I was reading about all this in the paper. Mm. Everyone was being nice to my face, and I was reading about it, this stuff. I'm going, and half of it, I swear to God, on my kids' lives, it was like, I cannot believe. This is one making the papers. I've got a belief. There's, you know, you hear a lot of journalists use the word source. A source says. Mm -hmm. I would say, change that word for coward. A coward says. Not a source because, what do you mean a source says? They've either got an axe to grind with someone and they won't come and say it to your face or they're just leaking stuff for their own agenda. I hate that. That's just so... But then, so, Payne, we had this conversation and he goes, mate, I'm out of sleep. I said, mate, just be 100% honest with me. And I'm sitting there going, you're joking. Awesome. No worries. And some of the stuff he said is like, you'd imagine he was telling me to... It was like one out of ten, one out of a hundred. It was the easiest shit to change. I'm going, no, thanks, mate. This is, and it was like a gift. It was like a gift. I've learned that in life. And people say, I oh, very intense. Don't don't mistake intensity with honesty. You know, Brene Brown, you know, the great Brene Brown, the Canadian, um, now she's on this, you know, she um, researches fear and vulnerability. And one thing she says, it's a beautiful little podcast, and it goes for, one thing she says, it goes for about 10 seconds. The lady says to her, what's the number one thing in leadership today? She goes, oh, that's easy. Be honest. Clear is kind, unclear is unkind. So tell the truth. We try and think we're being nice or think we're being soft by, and we're not clear. Be clear. Tim Payne was really clear with me. It was awesome. It was awesome. And like I'm clear, I, one thing I will always say, when people talk to me, they will never go to sleep at night wondering if it's the truth. And because it's clear, it's honest, it's kind. Tim Payne was honest with me. I thought, oh, Payne, I felt like, jumping through the FaceTime and giving him a hug. Thank you so much. And then this is the killer for me was that he gave me some feet. Then I rang Finchy. I said, Finchy, because I had this meeting that I said, Finchy, he goes, I said, mate, we've been captain and coach for four years. He goes, yeah. I know he goes, yeah, I've been a bit of a pussy, haven't I? I don't like confrontation. I said, what do you mean confrontation, mate? Just tell me. So he'd tell me. I'm going, oh, yeah, cool. And he's going, what, you're not upset? No, no, what do you mean upset? This is so fixable. This is easy, mate. And I've got a curious mind. Like, like I said, 63 in six hours of batting. The end of my career, I was belting them. You evolve, you get better. That's life, right? So they give me this feedback. I said, no, and I spoke to Pat Cummins. And Pat Cummins said to me probably five times, oh, mate, this might be brutally honest. I said, Pat, there is nothing brutal about your feedback. What's brutal is I'm hearing it behind my back through the media or through sources. And everyone, no one's telling me. There's nothing, bro, tell me. He goes, tell me. Oh, yeah, no worries. Great, mate. The hardest thing for me of it all, I've never said this publicly, right? But I, we also, you guys will get some headlines probably. The hardest thing for me of all of it was I got the feedback. I did something about it. We won the T20 World Cup. We won the Ashes. We're number one in the world. I've never enjoyed coaching more. I still got sacked. That's the hardest thing. Because you can't give someone fee, ask to give someone feedback, do something. It'd be like, imagine me saying to a player, says to me, oh, coach, I wanna, I'm want i the best one-day player in the world. I'm the best test cricketer in the world. I want to get in the T20 side. Okay, what do I have to do? I'll give them some advice. And they say, oh, thanks so much, coach. I'm going to go and work on that. Does, works on it, 
we pick him, give him the opportunity. He gets five man of the matches in the in the first five games. Well done. Mm, actually, we're going to drop you anyway, mate, because we like someone better. Imagine saying that to a player. So why well, why weren't you given the opportunity to get better? Why do you think? I did get I did get the advice and yep. I got better. I know, but and then sorry. Oh, sorry. Why, didn't, I, you, I got, why sorry. didn't you get to, Why didn't you get to keep oh, your job got, after getting better? You'd have to ask Cricket Australia that, mate. You'd have to ask. And the other thing is, you know, they used to talk about mutiny on deck. That's a classic. Like someone stole that from probably another podcast I did, one of my speakers. They say in leadership the captain comes out, one, when the iceberg presents, when there's crisis, two, when there's stormy waters, or three, when there's mutiny on deck. What I've learned about mutiny on deck is that it's usually one or two voices and they're the loudest voices and people listen to loud voices. And when I finished with the Australian career, I, I would have got messages that make you cry from 90% of the players. So I don't know, mate. You'd have to ask someone else. Do you look back on your time and wish you had a change or anything? Or are you a man uh, that m- moves forward? No, I, I know. I, I'm very self-aware. My greatest weakness, without question, is that I hate losing. I did as a player. I did as a coach. Now, when I, it's different in footy. When I got... And this happened through when I coached West Australia as well. When we lose, I go quiet because I'm actually very introvert. I'm a thinker. I'm curious. I wonder how we can get better. So I go very quiet. I don't rant and rave and get angry, but I go very quiet. And then people, when I go quiet, because I'm meant to be the tough guy, right? Even though I've got four beautiful kids, I love my garden. I love meditating. I'm the tough guy, right? (laughs) That's perception. Oh, you know, he's the martial artist and all this sort of shit. Anyway, so I, so when I go quiet, people go, oh, man, he's, not, he's not approachable. I go, yeah, okay, that's just after the game. For, uh, give me 24 hours to absorb it all and work out how we can get better. Yeah, I'm quiet. I'm not a ranter and raver. I don't get angry or very rarely get angry. So that's not my style, but I go quiet. And I know that. That's my weakness. And the players go, oh, yeah, he's angry. He's intense. He's simmering or something. Simmering yeah, away. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking and, you know, I go away and I'll, I'll go quiet and I'll meditate the next day and then I'm up and back into it. So, yeah, that's, how, that's my weakness. That's my weakness. And it's very hard to change your personality, mate. You know, and I was brought up. I've been, do, you know, I've, been, I've had 50, 51 years of, of mentors and learning and how you fight back and how you learn and how you evolve and all this sort of stuff. So that's me. That's me. Would I've done it different? Mm. I tell you, what I would have done different, and this might surprise a lot of people. But in four years of being the head coach of Australia, I presented to the Australian Cricket Board three times. Talk about managing up. I would have almost asked, demanded. Adam Simpson, for you know, I'm on the board of the West Coast Eagles, SCOE. Simo would present to the board, ah, oh, at least three quarters of every board meeting. And I'm on the cricket affairs, uh, the footy affairs committee, so I would know what's going on at the footy. And Simo lives 500 metres from me, so we have a beer together. So there's nothing I don't know. So if anyone asks me, I'm aware of what's going on in the footy club. That's the job of the board, right, is to just sit back and, and not interfere, not select, but just to be aware of what's going on and, and to offer some advice if it's required or to listen if things are needed. But I talked to the Cricket Australia Board three times in four years. That's craziness. That's craziness. And that's the only thing I'd do different, mate, is I'd – because when you know people haven't got your back, there is no lonelier place in the world – or whether you're not sure. When you do know people at your back, there's no more powerful place in the world. Um, and that's what I would have done differently. Do you think you could coach for the team again? The Australian cricket team? Mm. Uh, that's a great question. No one ever asked me that. Yeah, I could start the Australian cricket team again, but I'm not sure it'll ever happen. In fact, you know, I'm so happy. I, I can't remember being happier in my life than I have been the last eight, ten months. The thing about coaching... Um, well coaching probably generally but certainly coaching cricket is you've got to go away from home and you've got to go away home for a long time for a long time and I'm so happy I said at the st- when I first walked in here for 30 years I've spent 10 months away from Perth two months in Perth now I'm going to want to tailor my life so I spend 10 months in Perth and two months away from it if I have to mm. 
and I'll do some great stuff, you know, that takes me to just go on the World Cricket Committee. So I've got a couple of trips to Lords and somewhere else around the world, you know, there's some other things I can do, but I want to spend a lot more time in Perth and that's going to be hard coaching. There was two rumours that came out after you uh, were... Sacked. 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 Yeah. There you go. Uh, one, you're going to coach the English cricket team mm. and two, you're going to lead the Liberal Party of Western Australia. <laughs> so either of those have any merit? Oh, dude, that's what I'm saying about... <laughs> I woke up... The source? I woke up about... After everything that had been in the media for 12 months and then I woke up, it was a Sunday, one of the Sunday, Sunday Times front page. Me, I'm going to lead the Liberal Party. There's yeah. more chance of me having a baby <laughs> than going into politics. You're going to you take physically, to the you physically, land. like I'm you gonna, physically having a baby. Me literally physically having yeah. a baby. <laughs> where, so where did that come from? There, like, I, mean, has, I, I went. I went to. Um, You're a big John Howard fan, le- aren't you? Yeah, love John Howard. <laughs> John Howard's a legend. He's a liberal, isn't he? Uh, he's a, yeah, but he's a liberal. But yeah, but just because I like John Howard, <laughs> and I lived Margaret Court and Barry Court are my next door neighbour. I lived down the road from me. Like so, Barry's been lo- with me since the day I retired. Oh, when we get the liberal party, and we laugh about it. We joke about it. He actually got me to go and have a meeting with John Howard, the then sitting prime minister. How long ago? Fifteen years ago, and we just talked. It was unbelievable, a great experience. Um, but and I went and spoke to the Liberal. Lisa Harvey asked me to go and speak to the Liberal Party before the last election. I never forget. I said, I, "Imagine fighting Muhammad Ali. That'd be pretty scary, right?" Yeah. Now imagine walk jumping in the ring with Muhammad Ali, with your hands tied behind your back and your feet tied together. That'd be pretty scary, that wouldn't it? Yeah, that'd be scary. <laughs> and now imagine putting a blindfold on. <laughs> And imagine, imagine doing it with no training, no corner man, no doctor. Imagine that. Well, that's what you're doing. That's yep. exactly what I said. I said, so how about taking your blindfold off, take your handcuffs off, untie your feet. The only way to fight Muhammad Ali is being in the greatest shape of your life, having the best team around you. And if he starts beating, all jumping in and trying to beat him back up, because the only way you're going to beat Muhammad Ali, well, that's where we're at. So I went and, I went and that's how I started my talk to the Liberal Party, because Lisa Harvey, who's the patron of the Scarborough Cricket Club, where I played my whole life, so she asked me to come, or some, so I went and spoke to the Liberal Party. So that doesn't mean I'm going into politics. I'm just being a nice bloke and going to give him some advice. And if someone asked me to go and talk to the Labor Party, I probably would as well. But that's just what I do. I go and help people. So that's probably where it came Would from. Would you help the English? Would you coach the England cricket team? No. Wow. Um, Only because, and that was the other thing. Then it came, uh, the the other classic was uh, England cricket have have rejected Langer as the coach. He's too into, <laughs> are you joking? Well, you've rejected me. <laughs> you've No one's even talked to me about coaching the England. I'm home. I've just been through four years. So this is the world. This is the world we live. So then it becomes this great story about, oh, yeah, Langer doesn't get... I can tell you I've had six offers to coach, be a head coach in the last few months and I haven't looked at them. So, you know, because I want to be home. Mm. I want to be home with my family. I want to be home with my mates. I want to be in Perth. Um, I want to be happy. You were just talking about John Howard. I can't not ask about, um, you know, you, you did catch up with him. Did you give him any shit about his bowling performance that's... Um, it was, it was no probably Dan, Dan Const oh, yeah. like. Oh, oh, no, you know where he got stuck in his hand a couple yeah, yeah, of times? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Well, I guess. Well, it's a bit like your leg spin shit, <laughs> no. to be honest. Well, mate, the trophy saying. speaks for itself. It does. He's the Prime Minister, mate. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, so you weren't, you didn't ask him how he went with the, with well, the ball? No, but I tell you, I, can I tell you a quick story about John yeah. Howard? Yeah. And I talk about this a lot when I'm talking to people. So my grandfather, Alan Townsend, one of the most humble men in the world. Eight kids. My mum was the eldest. They lived in Douglas Street, Wembley. I used to live on Douglas Street. Yeah. What number? Uh, 142. 25. My pop. No, 23. 25, yeah. They lived their whole life. Two and a half bedroom house. Humble man. And worked for the Australian tax office all his life. One of the night, never heard him swear. One of the most beautiful men in the world. After my nana died, all the family put in for him to come and watch the Sydney Test match. He could not believe it. 
he's coming to watch his grandson get on the aeroplane, which is a big thing, come watch the Sydney test. He sat, you know, this Sydney cricket, and I got the seats right there in front of the, where we used to sit out on the little balcony there. And he'd sit there with his mate Bert, and they'd have their fresh sandwiches and their thermos of milk coffee and their cake that Bert's <laughs> wife had made. And at the end of the test, man, and my pop kept looking around going, you know, thumbs up, you know, it's all good. He was pretty excited. Anyway, at the end of the test match, he comes in the change room. I said, Pop, you want to come in the change room? He goes, what do you mean? I said, come in and meet some of the boys. I can do that. I go, yeah, come on, come in the change room. I'll introduce you. So he meets Warney and Steve, he can't believe it, right? And he's having his one crown lager. Not two crown lagers, not half, one crown lager. That was my Pop, <laughs> having his crown lager. So he's meeting all the way. He can't believe it. This is He's like in fairy tale land. He is in the Australian cricket change room. Anyway, next thing you know... Into this change room comes John Howard, the Prime Minister. My pop cannot believe <laughs> this does not happen to my pop. And he walks in, goes around, comes over to me. Oh, Justin, well done on getting another duck. Oh, thanks, Mr. Howard. <laughs> I said, Miss Howard, I'd really like you to meet my grandfather, Alan Townsend. They shake it. Oh, Alan, very nice to meet you. So then my pop goes back to the bowling club, the local IGA. I've met the Prime Minister. He tells everyone about meeting the Prime Minister. He can't believe it. Right? This is the greatest moment of his life. Met the Prime Minister. Tells everyone. Tells all the kids, family. To... That's not the story. My pop came to every test match after that, right, until my last test match, the one where I retired. Bit bittersweet for my pop. Last time he's going to watch the test match. His grandson... Pop, you know, come in the change. Well, this stage, he walks in like Viv Richards, <laughs> meets all these, ah, Warney and Tugger and all the boys here. My pop's pretty Viv Richards like, but this stage, walks in. Last test, but guess who walks in the change room? John Howard. Hasn't seen him for six years, five years. John Howard walks in the change room, goes around, comes to me. Oh, Justin, well on in your career. Da da da, thanks, Mr. Howard. Turns to my pop. Shakes out, Alan, it's very nice to see you again. <laughs> Remembered my pop's name. Wow. Now, I'm not sure who my pop used to vote for. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you who voted for after that. Yeah. <laughs> and the lesson in leadership is make people feel special. And that's what my, the great ladies in my life might have done for me, made me feel special. They do that. You run through brick walls for them, right? Or you never forget them. Or you keep voting for them. So that was my John Howard, and that's why. But the politics thing or the England thing, no, it's not on the radar. Uh, I've never had a guest where I've had to really wrap up, but I know JL's going to get out of here at some point in time. We've got a little bit to finish off here, JL, but um, appreciate your time today, mate. I know this is why you're here, though. This is um, uh, it's a podcasting segment um, known around the world, very famous social media not social media we know you're not on social media but social sco <laughs> yeah that's right tail don't pretend you haven't heard of it before social media where we let the people do the talking if you heard enough from dan and i mm. we've asked you the hard-hitting questions so now the people we open the forum they get to ask you the questions bring it on are you ready yeah um uh cooper brown i like this um, which west coast eagle do you think would make the best cricketer Uh, oh, that's easy, easy, what? easy. Nick no. Nat. What? Steaming in, bowling. Who are the scariest bowlers in the world, mate? The big, uh, back in the day, the big Nick mighty Nat. West Indies. Imagine Nick Nat Have running Have you seen him bowl? No, but... It's not a pretty sight. Yeah, I'm sure it's not. <laughs> but but you imagine him running at your bowling. Uh, we're talking about if he was talented. Yes. <laughs> which is <laughs> quite obviously if. not. <laughs> big if. Um, I'd say Nick. Imagine him running at you. Imagine him running on a, cricket f on a footy field, let alone with a little cricket ball in his hand. What about McGill.Grant? Uh, best sledge that you've received and best one that you've given. You can pick one if you like. You can either yep. give one. Oh, the same. best one, there's, there's a guy called Dan Cullen who used to play for South. He played one or two tests, off spinner. And I was playing, I was in the height of my test career, playing at the Wacker. And this young punk, he's about 18 years old. He's bowling, he's going, I'm going to get you out. I'm going to get you out. <laughs> it's a damn thing, I think. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. So damn. seriously, I'm going, oh, and this, you know, it's like, it's going, there's these little young punks, and they're sort of all <laughs> cocky. And he had his earring and red <laughs> hair. <laughs> and <laughs> earring and red hair and, <laughs> and pale skin. Sounds and he's like bowling Smithy. to me. And I was belting, yeah, like Smithy. That's what it looked like, Smithy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm belting around the park. He's going, I still want to get you out. Anyway, he gets me out. <laughs> so as I'm walking past him did not say a word he just 
He just winked at me. <laughs> oh, oh, shit. That was the worst sledge in the history of the world. This That's young good. punk on the star. I met him and he winked at me. I just, I wanted to flip and kill him. Oh, oh man. That's man, awesome. man good. Good. He just winked at me. Oh, oh man. Oh, seriously. Oh, that's really best sledge. Good. I'm not sure what the, my best. Sledge. See, everyone talks about sledging, but I never remember it. That's good. I mean, that's that's stuck with you. That's, that's unreal. <laughs> um, oh, C. Wilson underscore 28. What does, be a bit more broader if you like. What does Australian cricket need to do to get back to the top? Or maybe like if I can extend that. Like, how do you see Australian cricket right now? We've got some big challenges coming up. We've got the World Cup going on at the moment. Um, it would be very disappointing if they if they don't at least make the semi-finals of this World Cup. They still might. They still can. Um, but it'll, especially on our home our home turf, that's that's going to be important. We're, we're all, Australian cricket's always going to win a lot of games. There's so much talent, you know, and they're incredibly – there's a lot of money in the game now. Um, but they've got to be really clear. Uh, my gut feeling, it's not just for Australian cricket – it's going to be a fascinating next couple of years with the the BCCI, and I think it's just starting to heat up now. Because what's happening is that a lot of the IPL teams are buying all the franchises around around the world. So there's they've got teams in South African league, they've got teams in the UAE, they've got the IPL, they've got teams in the Caribbean. What could happen is a lot of these IPL players that Calcutta Knight Riders say, "Ask Scully, I'm going to you, I'm gonna, we're going to contract you." Mm. And but you've got to play in all these franchises around the world, and and the international cricket associations, which have always owned not owned the players, but they contract the players. It could be a complete reverse, a bit like the EPL. Yeah, where they sort of they play for their country, but realistically, they're correct. They're club correct. So th- so there's a lot of discussion about that around the world cricket at the moment. The problem with that is that not everyone plays T20 cricket. And that's going to benefit some individuals, but not everyone does. I mean, I just watched a brilliant Sheffield Shield game this week, a WA versus Queensland, and the Michael Nieces and the um, all these great players and great blokes. And that's where the foundation of cricket comes. They don't all just play T20 cricket. And there's a lot more to cricket than T20 cricket, but people see the money and the, the glamour of it. So we're going to have to be really watchful of that or very wary of that. I hope test cricket continues. One thing I've learned as the Australian cricket coach is most Australians still identify with what happens in the test matches over Boxing Day and New Year's and when the Christmas holidays are on. That's what they most identify with it. So I hope people keep an eye on that. And the other thing about cricket, a bit like golf, cricket is a, is a team sport, unlike golf and tennis. But what I'm worried about is that it's becoming more of an individual sport. So, for example, they've just had the Big Bash draft and they've paid the overseas players, not necessarily the best overseas, they've played overseas a lot of money, but they've also said before the even draft starts, yeah, but we're all leaving on the 8th of January because we're going to go and play in the UAE. So they're all double dipping. Mm. So they come into Mm. a team and then they're leaving halfway before the finals or before the business end because they're, they're going to go and play in another league. And that's, to me, very individual pursuit. And I, that would be a shame for the game. That's a good answer. Um, two to go. Michael underscore Edwards, 92. Uh, what's an off-field tour... Uh, sorry, what's an off-field tour moment that you'll never forget, playing or coaching for better or worse? <laughs> My favourite tour, 1995, West Indies. Australia hadn't beat, won the Frank Worrell Trophy for a very long time. We finally, we get to, and I actually get, and I faced one ball in three months on the tour. Ricky Ponting and I were the two young punks. We had the best time of our whole life, mate. You go to the West, it's the greatest tour of all time. So back cricket, and I was practising, but not playing. Anyway, Steve Waugh got 200 in Jamaica. Greg Ritchie jumped out of the grandstand, (laughs) blind, drunk, jumped out of the grandstand and ran out onto the field and gave Steve Waugh, because that was the day when everyone could run out and, Give you know, and I'll never forget that we ended up winning the test match. Greg Ritchie and Alan Border and Dean Jones come in the change when we celebrated. But De- Greg Ritchie jumping out of the grandstand <laughs> and running out to give Steve War a hug was one of the great moments. But <laughs> for any of the listeners out there, if you ever get a chance to tour the West Indies, it is the greatest tour of all time. There you go, Justin Langer, done and dusted. We're finished. The man needs to get to another function. We've overstayed. No, you haven't overstayed your welcome. We've, we've overstayed. Kept you. Yeah, we've kept you, mate. We appreciate it. Um, 
If you're listening for the first time, Backchat Double Underscore on socials. You can find all our stuff, backchatpodcast.com.au. Thank you to our partners, Whippersnapper. I might have to get you some of the Whippersnapper if you like having a whiskey there, Justin. Margaret River Roasting Co. if you like a coffee. Blue Bet, Shelter Brewing Co. if you like a beer. And Leadable Cameras for all our stuff that we got around here. That's done. That's Dustin. Did you have fun? Yeah, it was awesome. Scott, you've been asking me. I was very touchy when I first finished as the coach of the Australian cricket team. Why was that? Um, Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, it's, it's pretty obvious. I'd been a punching bag. I didn't have any teeth or I didn't have lips left, so that's why I couldn't talk. So, um, but no, it's really nice to be here, mate. I was extending, I was extending some support. I, I think we looked after you in here. Yeah, you've done well, and but at the time, I didn't want to say I was didn't had remained pretty silent for probably twelve months. So I wanted to wanted to keep it that way. It's been good mm. to see you, mate, and um, look, looking forward to what you do in the future. Thanks, mate. Thanks, boys. Keep up those leggies. I'll try. <laughs>